In early 2006, a light aircraft flew across the north coast of Anglesey on an aerial survey of the island. Then the photographer spotted something strange and took this photo. It revealed a massive earthwork about the length of two football pitches. Until then, no one knew there was anything here except a few lumps and bumps. But what makes this even more intriguing is its location. In a landscape rich in archaeology. And on an island that was once home to one of history's most mysterious groups, accused of magical rituals, human sacrifice, even cannibalism. The Druids. So what exactly is this strange earthwork? As usual, we've got just three days to find out. Wales on the north coast of the island of Anglesey. This is going to be a tough site. It's windy, it's never been excavated or even properly identified. So we get geophysics started early, send in Stuart to survey the earthworks and take a long hard look at that intriguing photo. Mick, we've got this huge site here, clearly visible, yeah. and yet nobody's ever dug it. That seems a puzzle to me. Not only have they never been dug, but they've hardly been recognised. Even the great survey of Anglesey done in the 1930s just said a few scrappy earthworks mainly destroyed. Are they mostly destroyed? <laughs> it doesn't look like it, does it? I mean, there's huge great banks and ditches. Have you any idea what period it is? Well, they just suggested it might be Roman, but I don't think we know, really. Do you think it's Roman, Francis? No, I don't think it is. It's got a very strange outline. Yeah. We know of at least two sites on Anglesey of that shape, which are middle to late Iron Age, and they're also known elsewhere in Britain. Well, I think yeah. it's even more exciting than that. It seems to me maybe more than one period, because you've got this, then you've got another rectangular bit added on the end, then you've got this bigger one round the outside. I've had a quick look round, and these survivors' earthworks, so it's a really exciting site. Yeah. If it is multi-period, and those later things are later than the Iron Age, and that's going to take us right through the key period of Anglesey history. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. The druids and everything, it's all waiting for it. Dating this massive earthwork is going to be critical. If it's Roman, then it's the product of one of the bloodiest episodes in Welsh history. In AD 61, the full force of the Roman army descended on this small island. Their mission? to destroy the stronghold of the British resistance, an insurgency led by the Druids. In a merciless attack unprecedented on British soil, they massacred the Druids and their followers and burnt down their sacred oak groves. But if our earthwork was built before the Roman invasion, then it could be a remnant of the very people the Romans set out to destroy, a relic of a lost world dominated by the Druids. Whoever built it, geophysics show this was a massive piece of engineering. Look, we've surveyed the bottom half of the field, away from where the earthworks are well preserved. So you've got the top of the enclosure in the earthworks, but look, really clear responses. And possible entrance at that point there, right. with maybe some sort of palisade outside. And is this settlement stuff that's noise here? Well, I presume so. Right. Is, is the black the bank or the ditch? That's the ditch. Right. So coming round and forming a complete circuit. Well, that gives us some obvious targets, doesn't it? A what, 4v5, 5v5 on Something that like entrance that, yeah. and what, probably a similar size area in the middle? Yeah. yeah. So we put in three trenches over the large rectangular feature. Phil opens a trench over what looks like the entrance. Matt looks inside the rectangle in the hope of finding evidence of settlement. And Bridge opens a trench across what Mick thinks might be a stone rampart. 
we'll have two bucket widths from there, that side of that line. Go, let's do it. The relentless elements have made the ground bone dry. Digging's going to be tough. Now it's going to start raining. Look at that damn rain coming over here. Oh. Look at that. And it's about to get even tougher. Oh. We're in for we're in for summer. You're in the best place. Yeah, I know he is. In conditions like these, it takes a keen eye to spot any archaeological signs of life. And luckily for us, there's one man who's ever vigilant. Ian, our expert digger driver. Just say, you've got the natural where it comes over the rise. Yeah. And then you've got the natural there, just in between there. That's not some sort of ditch. Where? You've got the natural there, and then go that way. Yeah, just through there. It's a change in colour and it's softer material. It is, isn't it? You can feel it. Yeah. Just tidy that up. Take that other job. You ain't got your print out in your pocket. No. Well, I've got it in my head, though. Eh? I've got it in my head. Is there a, li is there a linear coming through here? There should be. No, oh, well, that is it, then. Whoa, look at that. He, he spotted that. He felt it in the you finger. You should swap jobs, I think. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> Phil, with more than a little help from Ian, has uncovered what appears to be the entrance to the enclosure. The ditch across the front would have made it impossible to approach the entrance directly. It looks defensive, but is it Roman or Iron Age? An imperial fort or the last refuge of the Druids? I know we've got evidence of Iron Age counts in this part of the country, but do we actually have tangible evidence of Druids? If you go over to a, another corner of, of the island, to RAF Valley Anglesey, back in the 1940s, workmen, not archaeologists, discovered in the peat, where there had once been a lake, uh, cl close on 150 objects of iron and bronze. And we have um, some replica examples here and some images. This image of a bronze decorative plaque. Think of this as the Mercedes-Benz sign on the front of your fancy car. But put this on the front of your wagon or chariot. And the question is, who was directing the dumping, now let's use a better word, deposition, gifting of these objects, including um, swords, they'd been bent and broken before they were thrown into the lake. Who was doing that? So this is what Francis would call ritual deposition, just like you have on your own site at Flag right. Fen over in Cambridgeshire. Yes, absolutely. This is, this is one of the classic ritual sites. Uh, throughout Britain and Europe, you, you have deposition of offerings into bogs and wet places it is a religious activity mm. and it's only towards the end of that period in the last three or so centuries that it actually gets attributed to the druids they were the blokes doing the mm. stuff mm. nevertheless it does seem frustrating doesn't it that given the wealth of archaeology that there is around we haven't found any kind of druidic temple or tangible representations of druidic practice think of the the oak groves that were cut down by the Roman troops attacking Anglesey in AD 61. Mm. You know, what would be left of those because oak just disappears, it rots away. Just ashes. You know, how would you make those links? We want to discover whether the earthwork belongs to this complex Iron Age druid culture or whether it's a Roman fort built to suppress the local population. We've put a trench over some exposed stones that Mick thinks could be a rampart. Bridge has cleaned them up, and they're looking good. Well, Mick, this is fantastic. We don't usually find archaeology like this on day one. It looks we? very impressive, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not what we're looking for at all. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I thought it was probably part of some sort of Iron Age rampart structure. Sure. Well, of course, the problem is it's outside the enclosure. It's the wrong side of it. And it now looks as if it's the end of a barn or a building going off in that direction. And it turns out to be much more to do with a post-medieval farm site. <laughs> post-medieval? Yeah. Round about when, do you reckon? 1800, something like that, <laughs> probably. 
What we've got is this complex. The, all these earthworks over here, we thought the site might be multi-phase, yeah. multi-period. It is. The pattern of them suggests a farmstead quite late in date. And it's obvious when you look at it. Yeah. I mean, I hate to say this, but he's absolutely right <laughs> about the earthworks. Stuart's right. You are giving Stuart credit. Yeah, he's the done man the who you always say, oh, him and his high-flown <laughs> ideas. Absolutely. But he's actually come up with trumps in, in understanding these earthworks. I'm going to have a lie down yeah. after hearing him say that. <laughs> What it means is we've got to go that way. We've yeah. got to look at the, the interior of the enclosure over there and not worry about what's going on on the outside, particularly if it's that sort of date. So day one in our search for a prehistoric settlement yeah. and we've got an 18th century farm. <laughs> Very fine though. <laughs> Very fine. It's another 1700 years to go. <laughs> so far, this is our only datable evidence. In fact, despite some of our best ever geophysics, our trenches are beginning to look worryingly empty. Sure, nice a few bits of charcoal. Let's see, there's one. Yeah, quite a lot of it mixed into this deposit, but yeah, doesn't seem to signify anything really. You should have had. Have you had any pottery? No, nothing. Charcoal. Char charcoal. Bits of charcoal. Some quite chunky bits of charcoal actually in the subsoil. My instinct is, if you've got a blank area, then you extend off it. Yeah. find something. I agree with you, but I think there's a what I call a different plan now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the result of the earthworks and the geophysics. <laughs> if you look at that enclosure on the map, and you yeah. look at this bottom half badly affected by later ploughing, and that being post-medieval farm, then yeah. our best bet for getting the outline of this enclosure is going to be up the top there. Yeah. Have you Got followed it. this so I've followed it so far. Could you explain it back to me so that I understand <laughs> In the relentless wind, our plans and our minds are taking a battering. But as the clouds gather yet again, the archaeology begins to shine through. Ah, Francis. Yeah? I was saying there's not a lot of hope for this trench. There's actually a coin down here. Oh, hey. Perhaps this can help us to date the earthwork. De definitely copper alloy of some sort. And very, very fragile as well. Let's see if I can get... Underneath it, it's lying right on top of the natural, isn't it? Ah, there we go. There you moved. Go. That is extremely. Looks very coinish. It does, yeah. If I can turn it over. Mmm, be very careful. Ooh, uh. So we know we've got a coin, we know we're made of copper, of copper, some kind of copper alloy, and that's about as much as I can tell from it. I think conservation, no? Yep, yeah, call Bridget. Call Bridget. 999. And it looks like Bridge is going to be busy. Mick, come and have a look at this. Look, a Ooh. coin. It's out of context, but could be datable. Now, that's come off that spoil tip over there. And that looks to me like something early, exactly, early Roman exactly, rather than later, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. So, I mean, any dating evidence for this site is going to be important, isn't it? That's right. But, so, I mean, if we're trying to prove some link between the local Iron Age yeah. people and the arrival of the Romans, an early Roman coin is absolutely spot, spot on. on. Absolutely. That's great. So we send both coins off to Bridge. But even if we can date them on their own and out of context, they can't tell us whether this was a Roman fort or an Iron Age enclosure. And in Matt's trench, there's no sign of settlement, nothing that can help tell us whether the earthwork was built before or after the bloody invasion. So we've put it to bed and opened a new one over the bank and ditch. Hold on for one second, Ian. If we can find the bottom of the ditch, it could contain finds that'll help us discover when it was dug. Follow this edge. Is that the ditch fill? Is that a proper edge? I think the ditch fill is really soft. Yeah. And actually, this is fairly soft, but I'm hitting much more stones. In fact, you can see them yeah. and hear them, in fact. Yes. Like Matt, Bridge has found the edges of the ditch, but not the bottom. In fact, both trenches seem to be getting deeper and deeper. Nine feet yeah. deep. <laughs> 2.7 metres. Well, I mean, I'm absolutely speechless. Mm. What a treat. But what's amazing is how, what a small space it's fitted into, and we never thought it was going to go that deep. Do you think that it tells us anything, that shape, that incredible depth and narrowness? 
Well, I mean, normally, if you see something as narrow and steep and V-shaped as that, you'd say Roman, but we don't know that is its shape. And if it was Roman, I'd expect to see a lot of pottery knocking around. We the haven't had heaps. a whisker of a Nothing. find out. Nothing of it. at all. No charcoal. No. 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 And Let's... we've really tried hard to find something. If this ditch was Roman, we'd expect to see pottery, coins, or other finds, and the enclosure would probably be laid out in a neat rectangle. But it's empty and irregular, which means our enclosure is looking less Roman and increasingly Iron Age. Just as things are getting really interesting, the weather we've been battling all day wins. As you can see, the weather's turned really grim on us and everybody's been sent home, but it's been a fantastic day. This is what we came here to look at. Sorry, the rain's tipping down on it. These huge earthworks, but look what GF is has discovered. That whole field is jam-packed full of archaeology. There's our farm here, which we think is 18th century, but look at this great big curve, which the archaeologists are saying they're pretty sure is prehistoric. And of course, there's this massive earthwork. And Francis is still saying that he's convinced that it's Iron Age. I think it's something to do with the size of the ditches. So tomorrow what we want to do is get down deep into the heart of it and see if we can find out something about the people who lived there. Because if they were Iron Age, then they would have been the people who were here at that extraordinary moment when the Romans first arrived in Anglesey. Beginning of day two here in Anglesey, and we're just beginning to come to grips with this strange earthwork which covers this entire sloping field. Yesterday we found a big ditch which Francis swears is Iron Age, and if he's right that would be great because it would mean that the people who lived here would have practiced the Druidic religion and would have witnessed the horrible cataclysmic events that occurred when the Romans invaded, except Francis. <laughs> Having said all that, we haven't got any proof at all that this ditch is Iron Age, have we? No, and I don't expect to get much. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but, Tony, you don't get Iron Age pottery in this yeah. part of the world. Yeah. The depth of the ditch is fine. I'm quite relaxed yeah. about that. What yeah. about the shape of it? Does, it? does that help you at all? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, there are a number of examples of that shaped enclosure around sort of farmsteads in right. this part of the world. So it's yeah. not actually a rectangular, is it? Well, no, I mean, that, I think that's the point, though. It's not as if it's been laid out carefully, is it? It's a rock square. So but what might that imply? I would guess it's more native than Roman. No Roman army has come along with textbooks and no, measures, no. have they? And no, that's that, right, that's right. I mean, would you expect the buildings in this to be around the edge, or should we be looking for buildings in the middle? Wherever they've been excavated, these sites have produced buildings right in the centre. Right, so it really we should be looking in that middle area there then, probably, for the, for the buildings. Definitely. And it's a right. bit tricky because that looks like where we've had the modern ploughing, doesn't mm. it? Well, we, the, the top half of the site hasn't been, yeah. the bottom half has. I mean, my inclination is to do something as near we can to the middle, but over those two different degrees of destruction, if you like, and see if we can't pick a house up you in the middle. With I'm happy with different degrees of destruction, yeah. yes. <laughs> Yesterday, we opened a trench in the middle of the enclosure in search of settlement, without success. Today we're trying again, this time over an area that we hope has survived the plough. And while we look for signs of Iron Age life inside the enclosure, Stuart thinks there might be clues outside. He's sniffing around in the field next door with the local farmers. You can see boundaries in this field here, can't you? I can yes, see yeah. them, yeah. which yes. suggests there were fields all, yes, all yes. around it and so on. Well, I've seen aerial photos of this field years ago and there's like circular, I don't know what they call them, circular shapes there. All oh, right. But even with one field, this is a massive site, which makes it even stranger that our only find so far are two small coins.
see it's just breaking down that dirt nicely, but it's... Yeah, that's fantastic. Can you see that Gosh, well on the monitor? Yeah, I can. Because that feels Roman coin. <laughs> Apparently, yes. Why are you laughing? <laughs> well, we've I'm... been slaving away at it and we can't work out whether it is or not. I'm feeling very dubious about the whole thing at the moment, I must admit. Dubious about what? Well, I just can't find any decoration on it whatsoever. There doesn't seem to be any die or stamp on it that you, is likely to be found on a coin. Hmm. With the microscope failing to shed any light on the archaeology, Stuart and Mick take the opposite approach. They've gone up in the chopper to look at the bigger picture. Look, look, in that field over there. I mean, this is absolutely... I, I just, just as we're flying round, I can hardly take my eyes off all these field systems you can see in the yeah. fields around. It seems the farmers were spot on about the shapes in the field next door. There are circular features, I can see field bound. They see a trackway or a droveway yeah. going down there, which is what you'd expect. I mean, what it does show is that the enclosure that we've got is at the heart of a very active prehistoric Roman yeah, period landscape. Yeah. It's not sitting by itself, is it? But what's the connection between our Iron Age enclosure on the hill and the shapes in the next field? We're sending in Geophys to have a look and extending our search for the people who built this earthwork even further. Which might not be such a bad idea, because back in our enclosure, we're struggling to find any trace of them. We've widened Matt's trench over the deep ditch so we can get down and dig it out by hand. And Phil's still plugging away at the entrance. But so far, they're both empty. The only trench with any finds is bridges. We've got a lot of charcoal flecks, there's a lot of degraded stone, and we've got a lot of animal bone, really big ribs. It sounds promising. Right, so that sort of size. That sounds to me like modern cattle. But it's not. You've got big barn, 18th century, you've got a ditch, you've probably got cattle in the area, you've got to drain it. That's why you've dug this ditch. It's Absolutely. just a recut of the early ditch, done probably in the 18th century. My feeling is that we're going to waste our time if we spend too much effort here. Absolutely. Okay, let's just call this a day. It's beginning to look like any evidence of the people who might have lived here has been destroyed by later farming. Any sign of any buildings then, Rickshaw? No, unfortunately not. It's, it's all gone. Nothing, no. nothing at all? No, this is all natural. I'm really? And it's the same story in Rakshar's trench in the middle of the enclosure. If you see here, there's yeah. a ridge and furrow coming all the way through. So it, it must have been ploughed away. Oh, there's no. no structures or anything. What about joining it up with, with the trench over there? Do you think we could actually take a strip that, that goes right up that far? I, I think it's always an advantage to it join is. things up, isn't it? Yeah, can do. Gives us a much better chance of finding something. Yeah. yeah. The almost total absence of finds is puzzling. There's plenty of activity on the geophys, but nothing in the ground. While in the field next door, we can see shapes on the ground, but the geophys results have come back and they're empty. Not that Stuart's about to be beaten. Can you see these trees yep. on the hedge line? Yep. They're the ones there, so we've got one, two, three, four. Without the aid of geophys, we're relying on the highly scientific between the fourth and fifth tree method to plot in our trenches. So what I suggest is we put a trench across this ditch, across this earthwork and up to onto the other side and you should, if it still survives, you should hit it in a trench going across there. Okay. I wish you luck. Over to you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we'll find something in this field to help us date our site. Because so far, these are our only finds and dating them is proving difficult. We've called in find specialist Kai Payton to take a look. Initially, when those coins were dug up, everyone was saying Roman, Roman, possibly early Roman, really exciting. But then these waves of doubt began to hit us. Oh, maybe it's not a coin at all. <laughs> are they coins? Are well, they the, Roman? The good news is they are coins. They are Roman. One of them could potentially be quite early and one of them might be a little bit later. This one here, looking at the size and what it's made of, this looks like it's what they call a Cistercius, which could be as early as first century, maybe even a little bit earlier. 
But this one, I mean, it's in grotty condition, but it looks like a coin called an ass. So it's a grotty ass. And it's, it's made of some kind of a very coppery alloy, which is why it's sort of blue in the middle. It looks like quite an early coin. So this could well be a first century coin about, you know, the time of the invasion here. I think, as Kai says, they've been, they've been around for a long time. They've mm. circulated for a while. So you don't think that the early coin was being clutched in the hand by a Roman warrior as he murdered the Druids on this very spot? I think it's possible, but I have to say unlikely. <laughs> in fact, the coins are so worn, they could have been in circulation long after the Romans invaded, several hundred years after they'd wiped out the island's Druids. Their brutal campaign was so successful that today it's easy to think the Druids are more myth than reality. If someone mentions Druids nowadays, we tend to think of hippies in white sheets on Salisbury Plain, don't we? But do we have much tangible evidence that they actually existed in ancient times? We must be careful because whose territory are you on now? You're in Wales and we have living Druids, our own intelligentsia, who come together for our big cultural festival. Yes, but those kind of Druids are just an 18th century conceit, aren't they? That's, that's a fantasy, no, isn't Tony, it? Tony, our Druids today are our intelligentsia in Wales. Uh, they are musicians, but also think of those poets and those people who continue oral traditions. So then maybe we, we have a route into prehistory, into the pre-Roman periods, as to how these people behaved and what their special roles were. Why do we think they were an intelligentsia? Well, there's, there's plenty of documentary evidence. Caesar tells us that the Druids in Gaul, France today, which he happened to be conquering at the time, uh, that they came over to Britain uh, to study. That is the best teaching, the best source of learning. So what was this knowledge that they were imparting? Well, I mean, there seem to have been three types of Druids. Basically a priesthood and then soothsayers, sometimes called ovates or vates from the Latin, and bards, and it's the bards we see a lot of in Wales because they're the poets and the singers and, and the artists. But we can broaden their role. You know, were they the scientists? You know, we use, it's a modern term, scientists. They were uh, foretellers of the future. Um, we are also told that battles between the native peoples, the pre-Roman peoples, their own peoples, they'd come in as actual peacemakers, mm. so they knew that they're playing many roles. But that's not how the Romans saw the Druids, is it? They saw them as blood-drinking cannibals. Tony, as you know, the natives didn't do the writing. It's the Romans who tell us the story. It's a story that includes blood-curdling accounts of elaborate human sacrifice. But is that just Roman propaganda? Or could the Druids really have conducted such ceremonies? I'm travelling across Anglesey to find out. There's certainly a powerful sense of pre-Roman history here. It's not hard to imagine Iron Age Celtic people living and worshipping on this enigmatic island. One thing above all others that the Romans seemed to hate and fear about the Druids was their practice of human sacrifice. The most terrifying manifestation of which was this, the Wicker Man. Roman historians claim the Druids built giant wicker effigies in the shape of a man, caged sacrificial victims inside and burnt them to the ground. David Freeman and his team from the Talern Archaeological Group are using traditional woodworking techniques to build our very own wicker man to see whether such a thing could really have existed. Do we really know that this actually happened? We've got two pieces of documentary evidence. No physical evidence, though, unfortunately. Mind you, this is not so much a wicker man, more a wicker pair of trousers, isn't it? <laughs> it, it looks that way at the moment. Uh, the top half of him will be a different colour, so from the waist upwards. But, of course, we're not going to stuff it with human beings. What are we going to put inside We're actually it? going to stuff it with straw so that uh, we, get, we get a good flare, a good effect. I'm kind of a bit disappointed, it, it, really. It is a bit of a shame, really. Yeah. Is it difficult to make? Um, the main framework's going all right. My big problem is as soon as we start to bend in smaller circles. Willow should bend extremely easy, but we're so short of water in the wood at the moment, it's just breaking. I hope you're going to be able to make it in time. What you may not have noticed is that Victor 
is lurking behind us, scribbling away. And given that it's Victor, yes, here we have a wicker man. That's pretty amazing, Victor. Look, look at this little arm. That's horrifying. It is horrific, actually. I hope they can get somewhere near it, because I particularly like the head. It's made out of leaves and things. Oh, there's a little face here as well. If it's going to look anything like that, it's going to be really spectacular, isn't it? Yeah, it will be. Quite looking forward to this. See you later, Dave. There's no sign of druids back on our Iron Age earthwork. In fact, after two days of hard digging, the painful truth is there are no houses, no domestic rubbish, no sign of Iron Age people at all. We've got this huge ditch going all the way round this field. We put in a trench right in the middle of it because we thought there might be an Iron Age house somewhere around there. But we hit natural, so we put the trench to bed, or so I thought. Yeah, I, I thought it was natural as well, but he's got a different idea now. Well, he's certainly attacking it again with a great pick. <laughs> What's going on, Francis? Well. I think we got a bit of a problem. We thought it was natural, but when we put a trench through the bank beside the big cut through the ditch yeah, over yeah, there, yeah. I wanted to do that because I wanted to establish the bottom of the bank, right. which would give us the top of the surface that people walked on in the Iron Age. Yeah. Okay? Well, we have established that. If you go about six inches or a foot below that, you'll remove the old topsoil that was there. And below that, that's where you'll find the pure natural, OK? That's what we've done over there. And I followed it down, and I've dug a hole here, right in the corner, and you can see that the stuff in the hole is very much paler and firmer than this rather granular grey stuff on the top. In other words, you thought we'd put it to bed, but in fact we've left a blanket on it, so you... <laughs> So you can't see what's under the blanket. But is that the difference in the yellow is the natural? Yeah. And we've got the grey on the top here. But, which is weathered natural. Yeah. Right. So the post right. holes of your houses, if they exist, and that's a big if, will still be under this blanket. So if we are going to find evidence of the houses, does that mean we're going to have to take off all yeah. this? Yeah. yeah, we're going to have to take this off, we're going to have to take that off up there, and we might even have to extend this and take more off so we get more of an idea of the plan. So we haven't, we haven't actually finished the job, basically. That's why we've not found it. Mind you, the hardest job of all is standing still in this wind, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yesterday we had rain, today we've got wind. Yeah. And you feel completely battered at the end of it. And some of us can't remember the plot as a result. <laughs> it's Armageddon. <laughs> We thought we'd got to the bottom of our trenches. We hadn't. We need to dig down deeper to get to the Iron Age ground level. And when we do, if Francis is right, we could find 2,000-year-old houses, evidence of the people who built this massive enclosure, who may have practised the Druid faith. There's one day left, and everything to play for. third and final day here at Anglesey where we knew we'd got this great knot of massive earthworks which we thought were Iron Age but when we started to excavate them there was no sign of human activity no sign of human occupation nothing except this natural earth and stone and quite frankly we were all getting pretty worried but then yesterday afternoon Francis came up with this theory that this wasn't the natural, it was a blanket of earth and stone covering the natural. So he began excavating underneath it, and lo and behold, you're not just a pretty face, are you, Francis? <laughs> I must admit, I'm a bit chuffed, yeah. Yeah, we took it off with the digger, and lo and behold, underneath it, we've discovered post holes. Show me the post holes. Down here, I've labelled them up, they've got sort of... Uh, lost in the rain, yeah. but they're quite distinct against this really bright natural. And then in the middle here, this great pit. And I, I don't know what Going it all is. The way around here, like this. Yeah, it's absolutely huge. Cool. So what this means is that we've got to re-examine all the other stuff we were stripping yesterday. With one day left. With one day left. Phil, Yo. what do you reckon this might be? Well, it is. I mean, to, to all intents and purposes, it, it is a big pit. Whether it's a rubbish pit, whether it's, dare I say, a grave, I really don't know. The only way to do it is to dig it and find out. Suddenly all got rather exciting. It's 
Concealed beneath a blanket of earth with a Roman coin on top, we can be confident these features date to before the Roman invasion, even if we're not entirely sure what they are yet. It means we've finally uncovered the remains of Anglesey's lost Iron Age world, a world the Romans tell us was dominated by the Druids. They claim the Druids burnt sacrificial victims inside giant wicker effigies. But is this just Roman propaganda? We're building our own wicker man to find out. But dry willow and strong winds are making things tricky. They've got their work cut out if he's going to be ready to burn tonight. And back inside our Iron Age enclosure, the race is on to make sense of our pit. Francis, what do you reckon this is? I mean, it's got good edges there, it seems, but the pill is so extraordinarily dry, yeah. stony and loose. You know, it's not what you would expect from a pit of this sort of size where you might be hoping for all sorts of burials or whatever. Well, there. exactly. I mean, I'm half expecting to find a sheep's head with a modern ear tag in it, aren't you? Well, yes, but on the other hand, the surface that was above yeah. it didn't show any sign of disturbance. No, no, no yeah. it was sealed, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's the strangest thing. In the field next door, we're investigating a series of shapes Stuart and Mick spotted from the air. We've put in three trenches and discovered a network of ditches. So you think all of this is probably fields and agriculture then, do you? I think we've got to go back to that agricultural idea and, and keeping animals here and paddocks and pens, right, that kind of thing, right. and just no evidence of settlement whatsoever. So it's no. a landscape around our main settlement then? That's what it seems most likely. OK. With a vast network of fields and a massive strategically placed hilltop enclosure, this was more than just a simple farm. Whoever controlled it must have been a powerful chief. So with time running out, we concentrate all our resources on the main enclosure. Everyone that is, except Henry. He's wandered down to a boggy area in the valley to take a core of soil. The grey stuff at the bottom is 2,000 year old mud. It's a sign that in the Iron Age, this bog was a lake. This is so typical of you. On day one, you prowled around the site. On day two, you moved into the next field. And now we're, what, 200 metres away in the middle of a bog? Yes. <laughs> it's all about landscape context, Tony. I keep banging on about it. But knowing something about a site, isn't, it isn't sufficient in itself unless you know something about the landscape that site lived within and how it developed. And where we've walked to down here, doesn't particularly look like it to you, perhaps, but this was a large lake here in prehistory. So what do you think the relationship would have been between the lake and the people who lived up there? Well, there's, there's two relationships. One is very practical. One is supply of water. And from the crop marks, we do have evidence now in the field where Bridget's digging of a trackway which actually leads down from the fields towards this bog. They're bringing animals down to, to water them. So that's very practical. But of course, the other is ritual. Once you get into prehistory, that awful word, but we do know that lakes and bogs become areas where in prehistory people are depositing votive offerings, metal work. So they're actually chucking it into the lake? That's right. These are spe really are special places in prehistory. So there might still be Iron Age objects in this bog that I, were cast in 2,000 years ago? I, I think that's the case. We're yeah. not going to be able to dig it, are we? No, I mean, there's no, I mean it's actually very large. There's no way you'd, you'd even attempt to dig something like this. We'll let it lie. <laughs> From his hilltop home, the Iron Age chieftain who ruled this corner of Anglesey could see the source of his power, economic and spiritual, laid out before him. And he made sure that anyone looking back could see it too. If you remember, the geofish showed another ditch yeah. on the outside of the main big ditch. So we put this trench in. And what we discovered wasn't what we thought. It wasn't another ditch. Right. But we came across these big rocks. We yeah. found about five of these. And they went in, the, in a line across the trench here. So I put an extension in. Yeah. And I think that's the foot of a wall. So you got a wall through here. We got a wall. This, in other words, the bank 
that accompanied the big ditch yeah. had a revetment, right. stone revetment. To stop all this stuff tipping out over. Yes, but yeah. it, well, I mean, we've just got the bottom of it. It may well have been higher. Yeah. In which case, you could have seen a stone wall down there in the valley. Yeah. And it would have looked you know, really spectacular. And it sort of enhances this impression that this is a very high status, important site. It would have looked like a fort on the yes. horizon, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. In an imposing structure like this, we'd expect to find substantial houses. But so far, the only sign of Iron Age occupation is a series of small post holes. They don't look much, but Mick and Francis are impressed. It's probably the best evidence we're going to get for settlement on this site, for actual buildings and structures, isn't it? Yes, but dating them with any precision is impossible, other than by absence of pottery. But they're right in the centre of our enclosure, yeah. which is where we know they ought to be. So they're at the centre of power, if you like. And if we could join them all up into coherent pattern, I think we'd find they would be roundhouses, about sort of eight metres diameter, yeah. thatched roof, yeah. that sort of thing. But the posts can't have been very big. They're pretty small No, holes. but I think the problem is, you see, we're seeing just the bottom bit yeah. of the post hole. All the rest of it, the actual foot or more in which the post has been eroded by ploughing across this site. We're right at the bottom of them. So you're happy that there were actually Iron Age people building shelters here, not just putting up fences? Well, yes. I think it's more than shelters. I yes, it's houses. This, this would be a substantial house, you know, the, where people have reconstructed. They're quite substantial buildings. And at nearby Mellon Clernon, a team of experimental archaeologists and modern builders are demonstrating just how substantial. Their reconstructions show these were simple but brilliant designs. Carefully placed posts bore the weight of the roof and defined the large communal space. And a thatched roof would have kept out the very worst Welsh weather. It was the perfect house for this hill, a substantial weatherproof home fit for even the most powerful chieftain. So is the mysterious pit next door another part of this domestic picture? Is that yeah. going down? Yeah. That's going down? Yeah. yeah. Even Francis wouldn't get this excited about a rubbish pit. Oh, this is looking oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Hang on, I see another of these yellowy stones just yeah. under there. There, yeah. 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 Right, so what it looks like then, Francis, is a kiss. So it'll be a, a little grave, yeah, possibly, lined it. with stone and probably, what, Bronze Age, Early Bronze Could Age? Be. Well, it certainly is an appropriate size and shape for a crouched inhumation. If you yeah. know so much about it, do you really want me to bother and dig it? <laughs> <laughs> this is completely unexpected. Looking for signs of Iron Age settlement, it seems we found a Bronze Age grave, not two, but 4,000 years old. The oval grave was lined with large flat stones. The body would have been curled up inside. It seems the acidic soil has destroyed the bones, but the discovery helps us rewrite the history of this hill. We're saying those post holes are about 2,000 years old, and that burial is about 4,000 years old. In other words, the people who were looking at that burial were as far away from it in time as we are from the Romans. But think now, if there were a heap of stone over this burial pit, yeah. it was there, it was being respected by the builders of these new houses. It's odd, isn't it? Because for us, special places like churches and synagogues and, and what have you tend to be very much separate from our everyday lives, and yet that seems to be right in the middle of our, our age everyday life. But then, as, as we all know, the landscape has changed and the way we read the landscape has changed. And I think we've lost so much meaning in terms of, you know, the specialness of the hill, the ancestors who have worked this land for millennia. And that's the mindset, I believe, that these people had. And, of course, we were advised by those special people, those druids who were helping us to um, make sense of history. Three days ago, this earthwork was almost unheard of. One of the few clues to its existence was a photograph. 
Now we've uncovered 4,000 years of history on this Welsh hillside. It begins with one person, buried but not forgotten. Because 2,000 years later, this hill was still a special place, the power base for an important chieftain. It gave him a link to the past, shelter, food, even a sacred lake. He had it all. And then the Romans arrived. Life on Anglesey and on this hill changed forever. The curiously empty ditches suggest wind and rain began to fill them with earth soon after the invasion. The roundhouse post holes were covered by a blanket of soil and a Roman coin dropped on top. It seems the chief and his people vanished and the once mighty earthwork was abandoned. The roundhouses fell into disrepair or were even demolished. And the terrifying events of the Roman invasion were hidden beneath gentle pasture. This exposed hill bears witness to the island's darkest hour. David, it's really come on, isn't it? Yes, it has. Uh, growing nicely. We're almost on the last stage. Despite dry willow and strong winds, Dave and his team have proved it would have been possible for the Iron Age Celts to build a wicker man. Let me show you the head. Does that remind you of anybody? As Dave puts the finishing touches to our wicker man, it's easy to forget that 2,000 years ago, this would have been a gruesome spectacle. But stuffed with straw instead of humans, it's far from terrifying. In fact, it feels strangely familiar. Phil certainly seems to be feeling a connection. <laughs> it's tempting to find faint echoes of this ancient custom in our modern traditions, from corn dollies and the green man to Guy Fawkes. How much of the ancient British way of life did the Romans really destroy? How much do we owe to that elusive elite, the Druids? It's a bit like Philly, usually falls over at this stage of the evening. Pat's still unscathed, though. <laughs> Log on to the website at channel4.com slash timeteam to read more about Anglesey and explore other Time Team digs. Pain and pleasure in the South Pacific next. Shipwrecked 2007, Battle of the Islands.